Years back, I sat in on a class where a teacher was talking about the Karaniya Metta Sutta, the Sutta we just chanted. It started with the first line, this is what should be done by someone who appreciates the state of peace. Immediately a hand shot up. Someone in the class said, I thought there weren't any shoulds in Buddhism. And I watched as the teacher spent the whole rest of the morning trying to figure out some way of presenting the fact that, yes, the Buddha did teach some shoulds. It's strange, though, that that idea has gotten up that there are no shoulds. From the Buddha's point of view, that was one of the most valuable things he passed on, was giving people a basis for deciding what they should and shouldn't do. In some cases it was the rules, like we had the rules in the Vinaya. In other cases, some more general principles about how certain actions lead to happiness and other actions lead to long-term suffering. And based on that, you can decide. It gives you principles for deciding. And he attacked any teaching that would not provide you with those principles. So the shoulds are really important. You see them from the very beginning, Four Noble Truths. Each truth has a duty. Suffering is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. Its cessation is to be realized, and the path to its cessation should be developed. If you appreciate the state of peace, in other words, you believe that the cessation of suffering is something that really is worth going for. So here the shoulds come in again. I was talking the other day with an editor of a Buddhist magazine, saying he thought that the Four Noble Truths were just kind of an introductory teaching to get you interested in what the real issue is. is in Theravada we talk about things being constant, stressful, not self. And he said that's what the real meat of the teaching is. The Mahayana version would be the teaching on emptiness and interconnectedness. But those teachings don't carry any shoulds. You say everything is inconstant, I think especially if you interpret not-self as being no-self. There's no basis for deciding anything at all. Who's going to benefit? Nobody's going to benefit from putting in extra effort. It undercuts any idea that anything can be done, anything can be accomplished. Of the teaching on emptiness. I was reading some other pieces on emptiness the other day, too. It was all about how emptiness means that everything is possible. There are no constraints, but there are also no shoulds. They try to temper that by saying we have to be compassionate and realize that we're all interconnected. But look at interconnectedness. As the Buddha said, the interconnection basically comes down to feeding. All the interconnected systems we have in the world, it's not that they're designed for the good of everybody. Some sides benefit at some times and others benefit at other times. Look at the weather. When we're having a nice rainy winter here, a reasonably rainy winter, other places are getting flooded out. When they have reasonable rain, we get drought. The systems are not designed for everybody's happiness. In fact, from the Buddha's point of view, the fact that things are interdependent like this means that they're suffering. And because the interdependence is intereating, the best we can do is get out. So again, appreciating the state of peace, and then realizing what you have to do based on that. So the Four Noble Truths are the basic teaching, and the three characteristics, or more appropriately, the three perceptions are there to help you See what's worth holding on to, what's not, as you go through the path. If you work on something, you find that it's inconstant. You have to ask yourself, are these inconstant things, is this something stressful? Or is this the cause of stress? Or is it the path? The path, after all, is inconstant, too. Some inconstant things you have to develop. Other inconstant things you have to comprehend, and other inconstant things you have to let go of. And the shoulds here are the Buddha's important gift. Now, he's not a god telling us what we have to do, but his shoulds are conditional. If, if you want the state of peace, 
This is what you got to do. If you want the cessation of suffering, this is what you got to do. I think a large part of the problem is that a lot of people come to Buddhism having had their first spiritual experience with drugs. And the nature of a drugged spiritual experience is pretty passive. It's all about acceptance. Just let go and everything is really already wonderful. Which may be good when you're on drugs, but we can't go around and we can't live that way. We can't function that way. We're acting in the world. We have to realize that the mind is not passive. When you start being passive for a while like that, you can do it only for a little bit of time. Then you've got to get active again. And look what happens to people who are hooked on drugs. Anything. They'll do anything in order to get that drug experience again. This is where the ugly side of the, the eating nature of the mind comes out. When you look for your happiness based on something that's impermanent like that. So you have to realize the Buddha's vision begins with something utterly different, realizing the importance of your actions. We're all looking for happiness, and we're all going to have to be proactive in doing it. The question is, how can you do it in such a way that you're not harming yourself, not harming others? Because you do want your happiness to be long-term. And if your happiness depends on other people's suffering, they're not going to stand for it. So all the Buddha shoulds come down to the Four Noble Truths. That's his basic teaching. And the shoulds are his gift to us. Pointing out this is how action works. This is how the mind works. These are the ins and outs of true happiness. And again, he's not forcing us. It's a question of what we take on of our own free will. But he's provided a map. A map to true happiness. And said, this is the route. This is how it's followed. This is why he called it a path. It doesn't cause true happiness, the actions. But they do lead you there. In particular, they develop the sensitivity of the mind so you can see where in the mind is something of real, real value. So as we're sitting here meditating, we're engaging in one of the Buddha's shoulds. You know, should develop the path, should develop concentration. Anything that gets in the way of your concentration right now, you let go of. And when we do this, we find that we benefit. That's what the whole purpose of the teaching is. The Buddhist teachings are strategic. They're meant to bring people to that goal. It's not just a description of the goal or a description of the path. And the wise way of responding to the Buddhist teachings is to take on the path and follow the duties. This is why John Lee, when he's talking about mindfulness and the different qualities that you bring to mindfulness, says that ardency is the wisdom factor. As you develop mindfulness in order to bring about concentration, realizing that the teachings are there to be followed. The shoulds are to be taken seriously, because they give serious benefits.